the, the text that we're going to be kind of talking about is Genesis. Um, it's going to be chapter 28, verses 10 to 19. And I'll, I'll read it aloud at some point. But Thank you. Okay. But, I think I did read it ahead of time, but I don't always remember. I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, especially if you read it too far in advance, it might not stick for sure. Um, but before I dive into that, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background on, on Genesis, just a very kind of light, nothing too in-depth, but a little bit of a, a background about the text and, and uh, how it, how we interpret it in the United Church of Christ and kind of a little bit of its historical relevance as well as its current relevance today. So Genesis is a collection of many different stories authored by many different people over many, many years. Um, it's kind of came together during the, uh, the, the period of exile for, for the Israelite people during the uh, time of the Babylonian oppression in that area, uh, during that occupation. And Genesis was kind of compiled and written to give that people hope. Um, it was a, a book that speaks to new beginnings, speaks to creation and the goodness of creation. Um, it mirrors some of the historical creation narratives that we see from Mesopotamian culture and Egyptian culture as well. So there's kind of, they, they, it's assumed that they worked from those models to kind of create this while also contrasting and in different ways. The creation story um, is unique in that it frames everything as good, um, which is a really, I, I love that kind of um, message that it gives, is that everything that was created is created good, and that you know evil is not something that is preexistent, but is a, a free will choice based on um, the, the, the influences on creation, um, evil is a free will choice, uh, but it, it, it really sets the tone of scripture in that everything is good. And it is kind of an all encompassing text too, because it engages a lot of the ethnic and cultural diversity of the region at that time. You, you can read Genesis from start to finish and see quite a few um, different nations mentioned, different ethnicities mentioned too, and they're all engaged all in different ways. Um, and there's the, the, the tradition, whether this is historically accurate or not, that all of those peoples of that area are kind of tribally related to Israel through the different sons of Abraham, be it um, uh, Ishmael or Isaac, and then the continuation of those lineages. Um, that's kind of the, the religious um, historical perspective, not necessarily the, the accurate um, historical perspective. We don't necessarily know whether there was an Abraham or not. Um, but for a literary perspective, that is kind of the, the roots of, of this faith. Um, Genesis is a problematic book, too. There's quite a bit of stuff that um, informs people's ideologies today. Um, there, there's the normalization of, of uh, slavery, which is not necessarily something today, but it was normal for people in this day to own slaves. It's not necessarily the same type of slavery that was experienced in America, which was a very racially based slavery but anybody that kind of fell on hard times um, in that region, regardless of race, could have very much ended up in, as a slave. And it was a very normal part of culture. And a lot of times we will see in the text, the translators try and soften that language a bit to make the text a little bit more, or a little bit less uh, blunt and abrasive. Through the use of through the use and the discussion of slavery, um, and so if you see words like servants or maids, you know they're using these words, but ultimately the connotation is a very slave uh, slavery based connotation. Um, and Genesis offers a lot of uh, meat for ideologies today. Um, like I said earlier, there's going back to all of creation is good. 
instrumentalists tend to use that as as the basis of their faith based um, approach to environmentalism, saying, you know, if God created everything and we are treating God's creation with such disdain, ruining the environments around us for our own personal gain, then that's kind of a direct reflection on how we treat God. If we're treating God's creation poorly, then we're ultimately treating God poorly too. Um, there's another it, into the more problematic ideologies that Genesis can kind of um, offer. Uh, the divine curses on Adam and Eve have been used to support concepts uh, of men controlling women uh, and their bodies. If, if Adam had only been a stronger husband, Eve wouldn't have done what she did and they would have stayed in the garden forever. So there's some of those problems in there as well. Um, there is the curse of Ham, which uh, is a set of curses on the, the Canaanite nation. Um, and Ham is ultimately seen as the, the, that religious historical ancestor of uh, African people um, in that, on the African continent. That was kind of the religious historical understanding of the time, which is in, reflected in the Bible. And that curse ultimately gave slave traders, once we transitioned to a racially based form of slavery um, in the 1400s, it gave those slave traders a Christian basis upon which they were able to practice slavery. Um, that, that's one of the difficult things that Christianity has to reckon with is that slavery for centuries was a very, very Christian practice in, in, in its being. Um, there's also the, um, the text discussing Sodom and Gomorrah which has been interpreted as a story of homosexuality rather than one of sexual exploitation. That's, I'm going to save that for another Bible study because I could go on and on and on about, about that. I'm sorry about the, the phone here. I don't know. There's nobody on. So, um, but it, so Genesis has a lot of stuff in it that can really lead to problems it can also lead to solutions too. Um, it, really rooting ourselves in that very beginning where the tone is set, where everything is good, where creation is good and sustaining that goodness throughout can really be a great way to start reading the Bible, any text really in the Bible. And Genesis is kind of offering that beginning for us. So with that being said, I'm going to jump in and I will read from our selection for today. Again, it's chapter 28, verses 10 through 19. Uh, so if you guys are, if you are already, I'm, I'm gonna jump in. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he passed the night there. He took a rock and used it for a headrest and lay down to sleep there. And during the night, he had a dream. There was a ladder standing on the ground with its top reaching to heaven, and messengers of God were going up and coming down the ladder. And the Lord was there standing over him saying, I am the Lord, the God of Sarah and Abraham, the God of Rebekah and Isaac. Your descendants will be like the specks of dust on the ground. You will spread to the east and to the west, to the north and to the south, and all the tribes of the earth will bless themselves by you and your descendants. Know that I am with you. I will keep you safe wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I will not desert you before I have done all that I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke and said, Truly the Lord is in this place, and I never even knew it. He was filled with trembling and said, how awe-inspiring this place is. This is nothing less than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Jacob rose early the next morning and took the stone he had used as a headrest 
and set it up as a monument and anointed it with oil. And Jacob named the place Bethel, which is house of God in Hebrew. Though before that, the town was called Luz, which means separation. So before we kind of dive into our discussion, uh, there are some things that I'd like to, I kind of want to point out about this text and what is, what is being framed and what is being displayed in this short passage. Uh, Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham, is on the run from his brother Esau. They're twin brothers, but Jacob is the younger of the two twins. Um, and uh, one, one thing of note in that relationship is that quite often in Hebrew, uh, in, in the Hebrew scripture stories, the younger uh, siblings are, tend to always be the favored ones. Um, and so this, is, this kind of sets that story in a bit of a, in a, bit of a trickster way. J Jacob really tricked his brother out of his blessing and his brother found out about it and is very mad about it. So Jacob is now fleeing and heading off to uh, Haran to find, as his mother told him, his mother gave him a good excuse to get out of town, was go find a wife. Uh, and kind of ironically, there, there's a little bit of racism um, being, being played up by Rebecca in, in this story where she's a little bit sick of the, the uh, women that Esau has married. Um, and wants Isaac to find somebody that, is, that will kind of help keep that uh, Hebrew-Israelite tradition alive with them. Um, and so it's a very nationalistic kind of view at that point, which raises its problems. But there's, there's, it's tough to kind of resolve that. It's something that we just kind of have to sit with. Um, Jacob meets God on the road in an unfamiliar place, in a kind of scary, lonely time where he's abandoned almost. He feels abandoned. And this is a powerful experience, not only because he's out in the, in the wilderness and God just meets him there, but also because this is a reframing of a normal cultural understanding for the Israelite people that God is in specific places. We as Christians have the idea that God is what's called omnipresent, where God is everywhere. So we kind of can engage in that a little bit more. But the Hebrew people, especially um, ancient Israelites, believed that God was not only the was not the only God, and was found in specific places. So for Jacob to be met by God on the road was something kind of revelatory in its nature. So God meets Jacob on the road in an unexpected dream. And that's kind of ultimately the, the, the message of this story is that despite wherever we are, God's presence is abiding there with us. God is always with us, even if we may not know it. Jacob voices that God was here and I didn't even know it. So there's that sense of a very human experience that I think we've all kind of been through it one time or another where we haven't felt God there, where we may have felt similar abandonment, similar um, loneliness, um, but God is there. And we, we're taught, and upon reflection, in most cases, we find that God was there and we didn't even know it. Um, so that's ultimately where where the real roots of this text are. Um, and I, the, I think that it also influences us to think about places where we've experienced God. We as humans are very much oriented to the places that we have experiences in. And Jacob ultimately memorializes this place too. 